All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to KCP community meeting September 14th, not the September 13th meeting that this was origin originally called. Thank you, David, for noting that that did not was not true. Uh, it's been a couple of weeks since the last uh, one of these, and I think there's a lot to talk about this time. Uh, let's see if we can get through it. Uh, Michael was just talking before I hit record about this uh, Demo, I want to talk about the demo. I want to talk about some other stuff that's listed below and any other thing that comes up. So I might, uh, I might, Michael, time box you to some amount of time, but who knows how much. Uh, so let's let's uh, get started with that one. OK, sounds good. So just for context and history, we had talked about in this forum using some of the open cluster management API, uh, which really is focused on providing mechanics to do multi-cluster orchestration. So there's an agent framework that allows you to register to a hub. There is a framework to understand how to distribute work or desired configuration to a set of clusters. There is an API to help you describe your desired placement rules around where you want certain configuration to be placed. We've talked about this in that and uh, talked about those concepts in this forum uh, on prior calls. Um, in order to make that more real, uh, we put together a running example that We'll have a KCP API server. We'll have an additional controller that runs side by side. And that controller uses API from open cluster management to then distribute configuration to a set of clusters, the physical clusters behind the scenes. Um, most of the code has been written by Cho Jen. Cho Jen is in a different time zone. He's 12 hours off of, of our time zone. Uh, so he's not able to make this time slot. And then Hao Lu, who just happens to be on vacation, um, in this time zone, but just out of pocket. Uh, Josh Packer, uh, who's on the call, is going to take us through kind of end to end. And, and with that, Josh, I'll, I'll hand the baton over. Sure. So, yeah, I <laughs> I got the third pass of the baton here. And so uh, a, a lot of attribution needs to go to Shuzhen. That's a lot of good work here. As Michael mentioned, so it's based off the the, same, the similar demo that we already have in the KCP org with the deployment splitter. And so... What's been engineered is a version of deployment splitter, con splitter controller that is able to consume the OCM API, API specifically the uh, placement rules and the manifest work pieces. And so, Michael, I thought you were going to show a diagram, but I can just kick right into the demo first. Uh, if it, so, let's let's show the picture. If um, so, here I will pull it up here. Just to give a little context of what the what the framework and what it looks like. So OCM, um, maybe let me share my, or you've got the screen. We'll look at the demo, then I'll show the OCM pieces. Yep. So hopefully, can you see the picture now up? Yes, yes we do. All right. It's awesome. So in this flow, this is just showing the moving parts, right? So KCP logical server, the user will create a deployment. And that deployment will then have a reaction from the controller. The controller is going to do a couple of things. It's going to generate a placement object. The placement object is, in effect, you can almost think of it like a select clause for a set of clusters. You can attach various conditions by labels, um, by resource priority, uh, by other means that basically allow you to say, I want clusters that match this set of rules. And then an object called a placement decision gets generated by open cluster management and placement decision says, hey, here are the specific set of clusters up to whatever number of desired replica of clusters you want or you know, unbounded, uh, so all clusters that are available. But the placement decision now gives you the, here are the actual clusters that uh, match this condition. And then a controller, like our integration controller here, can actually use that information to generate additional things. And what it's going to generate are going to be these manifest work envelopes, which will package any number of objects that are coming in and place them uh, into each of the managed clusters uh, that, that are desired. So each managed cluster has a managed cluster namespace. Manifest work is a namespace scoped resource. So when you place a manifest work object into its cluster namespace, the agent that's running on the other side of the managed cluster is pulling that additional, that desired configuration down, reconciling it, and then feeding information back into the, the control plane or the hub to say, hey, here's the status of applying that work. So this is going to be the basic flow that, we'll, uh, that we're going to go through in the, in the execution of the demo. 
Comments, Perfect. questions here? None yet, okay. but awesome. I, I, I will have some, but I don't have any yet. And I'm intentionally not getting into this set and binding construct here. That's more about our back. I would, we'll mm -hmm. table that. We can cover that in more depth later on. The big thing I want you to see first is watching KCP logical server, using placement to understand where to deliver configuration. Notice that placement and manifest work are not objects that the user is interacting with. The, this is still preserving KCP's goal of straight kube native, user brings kube resources, magic happens behind the scenes. Exactly. Okie doke, without further ado then, this is the demo repo that uh, we're gonna use for this this show. There are a few pieces I have to push back that I patched just to make sure it worked. <laughs> end to end is maybe the uh, the key here, but it's everything under the contrib dem, uh, contr contribution demo section. So let's get rolling with that. So first things first is we set up the demo environment. That's going to run it. Uh, looking at too many pieces. So it's going to go out, it's going to build the, KC, the KCP OCM binary, that is the controller for the deployment splitter. It's going to launch out the KCP. Uh, it does some basic validation to make sure that uh, the system is good and uh, it's going to bring the controllers up takes a little longer first time you run through, obviously, because it's building it out. But once this is done, what I've got running in Linux here is the KCP controller and the KCP OCM controllers. And uh, they should have opened up the 6443. So we'll hop over to another window. We'll do a quick check just to make sure we're all good here. And yep, we see that it's up. So now we're going to run the actual demo piece. And so first things first is it's connecting to the hub cluster. Uh, this is where OCM or ACM can be running. Uh, it did a quick check we see here. So there's no managed clusters currently found inside of the hub. So we're going to import two managed clusters. So these are snow clusters that I've got out there uh, running OpenShift in this case. But again, it can import star KS, pretty much works. So the kubectl CM is a command line we have for bootstrapping onboarding of um, both the hub, so setting up OCM. And so if I quickly flip over this, since it takes a few seconds for the import to run anyways, uh, if we flip over here, we've got the open cluster management, the community page, et cetera. This is where the cluster ADM command line comes from. There's a couple of quick commands you can run to get started, and uh, and that gets you both the hub setup as well as allows you to do the imports. And all the steps are right here. It's part and of the a key thing I want to highlight here while Josh is highlighting this part of open cluster management. This is what we expect a role that is behind KCP would be able yes. to do. An administrator who's setting up the resources that are available to a KCP server, uh, to a logical cluster. We don't expect the developer who's bringing resources and saying, hey, I want these to be delivered to a set of clusters to necessarily have any visibility to this, but this is providing a set of, of well-tested machinery to drive this multi-cluster orchestration problem. And so it's pretty much, you know, these are kind create for your clusters if you want to build them, or I'm using my OCP, but you've got a single command to initiate the hub and then a single command that you use a few times, which is what I was demonstrating that uh, imports the individual clusters. So we'll click here and keep going. We're going to do a get managed clusters. So remember up here, we saw there were none. Now we've got two. We can see they're available and they're joined, which is what we're after. So this is where we get into the OCM specific APIs. And so we're creating a uh, managed cluster set. You can think of this as a grouping or the glue that's going to tie together the clusters that I want the KCP to apply to. It's going to tie together the namespace that I want to use um, to do the monitoring. It's going to tie to, it ties also user access together. So it's kind of like a resource grouping used to collect a bunch of pieces and provide our back against that. And so first thing is I created the resource itself for the managed cluster. Now I'm adding the clusters themselves to it. That's done via a, la 
a label. Um, that's going through, though, a uh, webhook that makes sure that you're, you have the rights to that cluster set to be adding the label to the managed cluster that brings it in. And then we can see we look at the managed cluster set output, and we see that we've got two managed clusters selected in there now. So now I mentioned we're going to bind. So again, we're gluing all these pieces together. So we have a group that represents the clusters. I'm now going to attach that to the namespace where I'm going to be, my KCP is going to be doing the demo. So I do that, which is again, uh, creates the demo namespace, but also creates a binding uh, resource that connects again, the group to the namespace. And then um, now we're going to move into the actual connected KCP. And so you can see here, we've done the connection. So we're using the demo coop config. This is the role or the loopback to my own cluster uh, under cluster demo. We can see we did a coop get CRD. So we can see that the deployment apps, if we were to jump back over here, that was configured over here with the extensions when I was setting up the KCP environment. And so I've got the, the CRD ready to go. And so now I'm going to create the deployment inside of my KCP demo, which I'm connected to now. And so at this point, we've now created a deployment resource, deployment.app resource, actually, just like in Deployment Spitter. The deployment controller has picked that up. And so as Michael mentioned, that controller that uh, Shu Jen wrote is going to go out. It's going to create the placement rule. And then using the placement rule, which is going to tell it which clusters to go to, it's going to create the manifest work object, which delivers it and deploys the placement remotely. So now we're going to switch over back to the hub itself to see the placement rule that got created by the controller. And so we see a placement rule is created. Now, this is just a prototype implementation. So for each deployment, it's creating a specific placement rule to make sure it goes into a certain place. There are a bunch of different ways we can slice this up, but you could have for a KCP that's managing, let's say, two or three clusters, you could have a single placement rule because you always want all of the apps to be sliced or um, sharded across those. So there's a bunch of different ways to play with the placement rule. As, as Michael mentioned, I always look at it as kind of the filter. So the you can imagine the cluster set, the grouping is the superset with all your clusters that KCP will have access to. And the placement rule is used to filter that down to a specific set within that. Now, in this case, we're just doing all because we only have two clusters. But that could be you know half the clusters. It's a label-based matching. And if we click over here for a second, so this is in the open cluster management IO. Um, if we look at some of the enhancements that are coming in, again, this is this is where using the placement sort of it it presents a lot of opportunities. And so there's a change we're making to be able to look at taints and tolerations against the target clusters to decide where it's you know which ones have available nodes where we're going to go we also have and, and for me this is the this is one of the important ones not just in kcp but outside in the way we do application management is resource scheduling as well so being able to look at a list of 10 clusters and say i need to deploy it onto two of these, and I want the two that are the least utilized, as an example. Or I want the two that are the most utilized so that I can improve my packing layer. And so this is continually uh, continuing to expand in the community. And so you know this is one of the sort of key pieces that the OCM brings with the delivery, is that being able to filter on a bunch of different capabilities as well as now dynamic resources, et cetera. Questions? because I probably started talking fast. <laughs> All right, we're going to flip back here then. So um, we had it, and we're going to take a look at the actual placement rule output. This is actually the, it's called the uh, placement rule decision kind that you find, and we can see it match the two. And as I said, depending on the type of spec you create, it can be just a label match to find all open shift. It can be a not in match expression, to, so it's standard coop selectors to not choose OpenShift, so to do star KS. Uh, and then we're adding these additional ones around taints. There's a around, there's ones for, is the system on the managed cluster online or offline, and therefore don't target it, et cetera, et cetera. So as Michael mentioned as well, um, so we had the placement rule created by the controller. We also create the manifest work. And so this is the encapsulation of the 
deployment object that is going to then be deployed to the remote systems. Um, so what it does is there's a manifest work created for each of those. Now, again, this is the prototype, so it's just a one-to-one. -one. The deployment is stuck inside the manifest work. But you ha we have the option that you know if we want to connect using, say, the application label, so part of like that's used by the OpenShift Dev or um, Argo CD uh, that's annotated onto resources, um, the controller could look at those and build a single manifest work with all of those pieces inside of it. And so the encapsulation is not just doesn't have to just be a single resource, but can be multiple multiple resources as well. So there are different opportunities and different ways to expand it. And then we can talk a little bit about some of the scale pieces we've done as well with manifest work um, and about how many clusters we've targeted, et cetera. We have some, I have some data I can share on that if people are interested. But anyways, um, so we have the manifest work. And again, this is what is then pushed down to the managed cluster as an applied manifest work. And that payload is then instantiated in the uh, in the managed cluster or the target. So now we're going off and we're using the kube config zero to connect to the remote cluster and it did a get deployment and then we see the kube config zero two which is the other one. So you can see we actually showed Jen put in some code uh, to um, to discern the replica set. So we look at the deployment, the deployment had a replica set of three and we knew we were going to do clusters. So it spread or sharded the deployment out to those different clusters in this configuration. If we had had three clusters, then we would have seen one deployment on each of them. And um, you know, from a, a speed perce perception, how long does it take to get down there? We're talking in the 20, 30 second tops Bracket. And I guess I said I would share some data. In a different thread, we've been doing some applications of our subscription, which is also subscription kind, which is also in the um, the OC part of the OCM community. Uh, but I'm not using that here. But we deployed that uh, using manifest work. We did actually the subscription object and three other resources, some roles and uh, service accounts um, to 2,000 target target clusters and it took a pro once they were written out it takes less than 20 seconds for it to be written to the managed cluster for 2000 of these remote client clusters that we were targeting so we know we have some scale capabilities and we're actually doing some runs now to ramp that up to try you know three, 400 manifest work across the same 2000 clusters just to make sure we have the scale properties that we think we need uh, you know, to be able to take this down the road to edge telco, et cetera. So anyways, so that is the deal. So what, again, just to sort of recap is we've got the deployment controller that's running there that, uh, or sorry, the deployment splitter controller that's running there that instead of using the sync is going, is going out and looking for a placement rule. If it's not there, it's creating the placement rule, which tells you which managed clusters in our group it's going to go to. It's then creating the manifest work based on the results of that placement rule in each of the namespaces on the hub that represent that managed cluster. And then that manifest work then propagates down to the managed cluster and applies it, which is what we're seeing here at the end. And then the controller, Shogen added some smarts that allowed it to take the fact that there were three replicas and split them across those given clusters. But again, this is you know, this is a prototype and this is where we have room to to play with different things. And it's always expanding um, what we're doing in OCM, obviously. And as we add more and more of these placement, uh, placement capabilities, there become a lot more different options in this space of sort of how you want to do delivery, how we want to do um, stacking. So, so that's what we wanted to share with you today. <laughs> yep. And so, maybe... And just to throw in right there, the other aspect here is if you adjust the placement or a new cluster joins um, or a cluster is taken away, the placement will automatically reconcile and adjust its list of decisions. So yes. then a controller that's watching that can react. And so we use the same capability as Josh was highlighting with subscriptions to cause an application to appear to move from one cluster to another. And that's true for stateless applications, right? We basically scale down or remove resources for the app in cluster one, scale up or add resources for the app in cluster two. And the, the emergent behavior right at a distance is the application moved from A to B. Um, we've got some additional work in place with volume replication where we are, can now actually migrate a stateful workload 
by pre-mirroring a PV or set of PVs that the application needs, scaling it down in cluster one, scaling it up in cluster two with the relevant PVs and you're off to the races. And that's using other projects um, uh, in the community. And that's actually great. So this is a great demo. Thank you. Thank you all for doing this. Um, so I'd probably say, um, you know, something I'd really like to see, um, and this maybe Jason, we need to get that, um, the app, app experience, uh doc cleaned up and then shared with the community side uh and then i would probably say it'd be useful to show kind of the equivalent the equivalent to the experience through the placement right because there's some there's some subtle things in here you know michael as you're talking about it uh you know we'd want to make sure that the ex the experience that the end user sees from the kcp side um, from the transparent multi-cluster side is transparent so there's some of the nuances in there so that'd be a great um, you know, next step for this from a demo perspective, would love to see it. Sure, and the way that we structure this, right, we're definitely going behind the curtains because we wanted the community to see what's possible there. Um, but from a user's perspective, if they go back to the KCP server, to the KCP logical cluster, and they interact with it, they'll continue to only see their deployment. Uh, there's an open switch around, and I think this is true for KCP in general, how does the set of objects that they create in the logical cluster reflect the aggregate status back from that same object being replicated, right? The deployment, if its replicas are spliced across multiple clusters, how do you reflect back into the original deployment object X of you know Y deployment replicas is available or not available? Um, so, um, there's there's an open switch here in this demo as well. There's there's limited feedback. We have feedback on like the manifest work objects, but we haven't done a lot to aggregate that or, or try to format it in a way that would fit back into the KCP logical cluster. But the user yeah, doesn't I, have visibility to these other parts that are behind the scenes. Yeah, and I think that's that's really important. Like the um the the mental model would be there's a set of expectations and experience, and mm -hmm. they have to be consistent with the existing cube, or that's not transparent those expectations will be, you know, some of the a deployment behaves like a deployment, there'll be other expectations called out in that doc um, that will get cleaned up. Um, and will be things like, um, there is a way to go see pod logs or exec on pods, that the different solution doesn't mean they can't compose. And it may very well be that actually the best outcome here is we end up with a couple of different um, avenues and angles like so we know that we'll hit, you know, some limits and some types of transformations that may be um, a perfectly reasonable low scale approach and then we say okay well what are the gaps that would cause us to fail when we hit you know muxes of you know 10,000 or 100,000 applications and we don't have to worry about that today because we're focused on making sure that we have that that right experience in place so um, mm -hmm. I would I would absolutely like to see maybe like steps one and two and Jason when we get that doc cleaned up like it would be steps one and two probably would be you know, the stateless and the stateless example, what it would look like, um, you know, in this, and if the demo could show that, that'd be great. Okay, awesome. Yeah, this is this is a really cool demo. Thank you for that, for sharing it. And for the people that actually built it that aren't here, uh, hopefully watching this later, thank you for building it. Um, it seems like a uh, an interesting avenue to basically replace or, change how the the deployment splitter is phrased and to replace the sinker code like the kcp sinker is not involved in this demo right it, it instead it is uh gotcha. kcp as the api server and this new controller that that schedules offloads to ocm stuff and ocm does the rest which uh i think is an interesting avenue to explore uh to and, and concretely not, yeah a key part of the proposal here is um, we are proposing that the cluster lit agent be leveraged versus the current sync implementation. There's there's a um, a very reasonable registration protocol for the cluster lit agent running on a cluster to join into a hub today. Um, there is a request here that instead of kind of the labeling method of driving placement decision, which occurs today when the, de the virtual deployment uh, or you know copy of the deployment gets gets created. Here we're using placement so that we can amend and extend the logic that's used to form a decision and then also document 
what the result of the decision was in a first class way. Like you can look it up by looking at the placement decision. Um, the reason there is a placement and a placement decision is because of scalability. Uh, we used to have a, a type called placement rule, which still exists. It, it's still supported in the product uh, and it's still available in the project, but we moved it into a different API group and we've made some changes as a result. The original placement rule captured decisions in the status condition of the rule. But then when we start pushing the limits of two and 3,000 clusters under management, uh, we risk ex exceeding the size of the SCD object limit. So placement decision can have um, one decision of up to, I forget what the hard limit is. Um, it's got a hard limit of how many decisions it'll record. And then the controller will create additional decisions if there are more clusters and will fit neatly into etcd right so there's there's already some aspects here of scalability that, that we've gone through so i think there's a lot of, of power and capability that can accelerate the objective of kcp right you yeah. can leverage it here some i think there was a conversation about could you have multiple kcp servers that schedule work into multiple uh, physical servers right splicing up the workspace where you've got maybe one or a set of projects or namespaces that are spliced across many clusters. You could absolutely do that with this flow here. Um, you'd have all, of, you could have those clusters assigned to one cluster manager, and then each KCP logical server might have, uh, might even share placement rules, but then only be putting work in specific namespaces or projects, uh, you know, when they are sharing a physical cluster behind them. Um, but so I think, you know, I'll take the action, uh, Clayton, that we want to look at the doc, look at the use cases, uh, what the experience we want to create for the KCP developer. And then we can amend this prototype, you know, continue to, to iterate on it. We welcome PRs for any updates that folks want to try. Um, I know I, I see John on, on the list if we wanted to experiment with bringing in some of the stuff uh, with re uh, PV replication at this level, that's something we can play with here as well. So there's, you know. Uh, just maybe I had a um, question and, and possibly interesting direction for this work. Um, that's how it's related to API negotiation, because um, currently uh, one thing that exists in the sinker and is integrated with the cluster manager, um, uh, cluster controller, sorry, is um, the fact that when a cluster joins the, the KCP uh, on, a, on a given uh, logical cluster, then um, a number, it's configurable, of course, but a number of uh, APIs from the physical clusters are pulled from the open external, you know, open API models that are in the discovery API, and then uh, are, are reconciled or, let's say, negotiated with possibly existing APIs in the logical cluster for the same API. Uh, and then when it's it's uh, everything is, is consistent, then the, 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 the API is published inside the, the logical cluster uh, as a CRD. And this yeah. allows, typically, if you have two clusters and you have, let's say, the deployment API of one of the clusters that is not compatible with, uh, with the other one or with the internal deployment if model that already lies in, in the logical cluster, then it, it becomes an additional placement rule, in fact. That means that um, deployments will not be scheduled on one of the clusters because the API of this cluster has been seen as non-compatible with the APIs that is internally used in the logical cluster. Mm -hmm. So that could be very interesting to explore how uh, the prototype that you did could be, you know, merged with this uh, API stuff. Typically, in the existing, um, yeah, Sinker and Cluster Manager, it's just when when you bring a new, a new cluster, uh, that then mm -hmm. you pull uh, the the requested APIs, and then of course all the negotiations start, and so that could possibly be also something to do when you import a managed cluster inside you know your logical kcp logical cluster then Agreed. you know get the apis uh, do Agreed. and stuff. we we Agreed. intentionally avoided um open cluster management is not very opinionated at all mm. on type negotiation as kcp is and so those sure. parts i think are 100 complementary i think you could 100 take the 
API negotiation behavior, we could do a couple of things, right? Continuing to create the negotiated kinds in KCP so that you can mm-hmm. understand sort of the minimum surface area yeah. could continue completely as is. Um, and I think Hal has reached out to you and kind of begun providing some feedback as we're trying to play with that, um, Hal Lu. And then the other side of it is we could ex- extend the concept of uh, placement. So the yeah. placement controller is incorporating different conditions, label mm-hmm. matching where the managed cluster API object has a set of labels and the placement matches those labels yeah. in order to come up with a decision. Uh, you can match on the cluster conditions, right? Whether the cluster is considered available or joined or not. Mm-hmm. Then you can match on, uh, most recently we've added um, resource utilization or resource capacity, right? Available yeah. memory capacity, available CPU capacity in order to prioritize which clusters are mm-hmm. possibly selected. So. And and we expect to, I think uh, Josh had the PRs up, you saw taint and tolerations is something, mm-hmm. you know, there's a, a lot of parallels to Kubelet yeah. scheduling behavior that that's built into some of the way that we think about this. Yeah, so, uh, so the, sorry, yeah. So and guys, this we, 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 we negotiation could be another guys, condition there. Okay. Yeah, let's let's take it. So it sounds like, so there's three action items I've heard. So there's the, um, the getting, making sure that the experience the app experience doc has a set of clear expectations that then the this could be like a step one and two in that you could see can we emulate those or can we satisfy those and what would be the challenge of the trade-offs. The second point I think is um, you know, as the transparent multi-cluster design doc evolves, I expect that we would say we need to consider the model that represents how locations and actual placement is bound, as well as the scheduling model and other characteristics of that, like Certainly, there's a longer term discussion on um, we want to do scheduling across lots of types of things, not just cluster resources. And so anything that's too focused on clusters has to be abstracted, right? Like the problems of how do we assign things to shards overlap. So that's they'll put that in the shard discussion. And then there, I think the experiential parts of negotiation of API objects. The point of that is to create an experience for the end user where they see a consistent object and they're immediately aware when um, their objects move out of sync or an administrator is immediately aware. Both of those are things that are relevant from an OCM side. Is there anything else I missed, Jason, or I think that's it? Michael, anything I missed in that? No, that's on three. Yeah. All right. Hey, I do have a um, question. Yeah. Um, right, go ahead, Jason. You want to say something? Yeah. I, I, so I, I want to, to kind of like stress on that transfer and multi cluster. I know, like Michael, you've said from the end user, this is like nothing will change and it is going to be transparent. But when I think about like how work is being presented to the granular physical cluster, and think about you know the manifest work, like is the like is the cluster lit having a star permission to kind of be able to apply all the things it needs to apply, like deployment, secret services, whatever gets Need, or do we have a more granular way of saying, you know, the cluster that is limited to that set of resources um, because I negotiated it or I I limit through the concept of placement or whatever that cluster led to only have access to these set of resources and only these set of resources. Um, I I I think this is a good topic. I don't. Uh, let's take this to one of the channels actually, and maybe that's something Michael and Jason we can yep. discuss there. I, just because I want to get yeah. to the other topics, and we're at forty minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for this demo. Obviously, uh, a lot to uh, discuss there. Let me re-present. Um, you seeing this? Um, I've added, uh, or I will add AIs from that discussion above. Uh, one thing I wanted to talk about uh, was KubeCon is, is coming up. It's about a month from now, and we'd love to have something we can show to say, like, this is the new demo based on the previous demo. This is what we've, uh, this is what we've produced, and what we're, where we're sort of thinking about going in the future. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is CRD negotiation. David's work on CRD negotiation and the demo for that is good, done, uh, already in the can. Um, beyond that, I'd love to be able to demonstrate some transparent multi-cluster progress in terms of 
Uh, so the previous demo is here's a deployment split it into two deployments, right? And that's that's great. That's magic. Um, I think the next thing is to say uh, this deployment depends on this secret or config map, or this deployment depends on probably not a volume because those are uh, tricky, but uh, going the other way, also this service depends on this deployment um, and how we would transparently multi-clusterize not just the deployment and split it, but also transparently multi-clusterize the dependence of those deployments and the things that depend on those deployments. Um, and um, just a question here, Jason, uh, was the the final, I mean, the temporary decision on that uh, to mainly put everything that is in a single namespace to the same cluster? So, so that's certainly that's certainly a large hammer, right? Like that's that's the easiest possible way to do this mm. to just schedule, you know, logical cluster namespace to basically a random cluster. Or you know, we could we could do better than random in the future, but yeah, uh, a first pass would be this namespace within this logical cluster gets assigned to this physical cluster. Mm. Um, yeah. That is definitely easy to do, um, which has a benefit because we want to show this off in a month. Uh, I think if we do that, if we simplify that, then there's no reason not to take on the stretch goal of being able to show that they move. So because that scheduling decision is so dead simple, uh, then it should be dead simple to detect the cluster we put you on went away, uh, you know, unassign that namespace from that cluster and put everything there. Um, yeah, Jason, I'm, I would probably say that the same statements we were making in the in the in the OCM example would be uh, we need the use cases globally referenceable, and we should target, you know, showing. We would say we'd show TMC progress with this use case. Um, yeah, that would that would be more concrete, and then we would say here's the things we're omitting in order to get sure. Um, yeah, yeah, no. So I think I think the uh, making that uh, making that. I want to use a different word besides milestones because that means a specific thing. Uh, making that progression of progress public would be good for OCM folks to, to uh, base their thinking off of just to let people know what our thinking is. And then also as a soft non-committal uh, milestone roadmap of where uh, of this demo, the next demo, the next demo, the next demo. Um, yeah. And I say that mostly because, so like we got two bullets here. So like the third and fourth bullets I'd probably say is um, some some level of ingress movement, which would be Joaquin's efforts. Um, and then some level of, as a stretch potentially to support maybe use case one or two, the inner service connectivity, or at least uh, somebody who's looking towards that direction. So Ben or Ben Bennett might be able to, to be the one tagged for that. There's the um, organizational, so the, the policy aspects, organizational workspace and otherwise, um, I'd like to get those use cases down. I've got half of them in a draft update to the investigation PR based on just, yeah. you know, the idea of, you know, clarifying terminology like, you know, instead of logical cluster, logical cluster is the mechanism workspace might be the actual API object. An organization is a thing that is a, is a itself a workspace under which workspace objects can be created that carries ownership. One of the other API policy objects down the road, things like stuff in the ACM world for policy stuff, like um, other types of um, organizational structure, like personal workspaces or organizational workspaces, how you might model those. So that would be, that would probably be like organizations and workspaces would be the, the policy aspects there. And then the sharding stuff, uh, I don't think it has to be for this, but I do think getting to the point where we can articulate what the the working across workspaces looks like from a controller point of view in some form. So whether that's through Syncer and TMC, or whether um, some of the stuff Steve and I are kind of iterating on right now, like we demonstrate yeah. some variation of a workspace flow um, or a uh, location specific flow would be enough. So experience wise, I would have to get use cases for the organization and have those docs. So that would probably be three. Is there something else that we're forgetting in terms of end user experience? So we've got um, we've got uh, a cube user coming to this has a developer or a application lifecycle experience 
that is agnostic to clusters. That's a continuation of our previous promise. And then we have the, could we make control planes scale for larger and larger sets of application teams by decoupling the idea of a cluster from the APIs and an STD instance from one cluster? Logical cluster organizations and workspaces. Is there something else I'm forgetting that would be in part of that arc? My instinct is almost certainly, but uh, I. Minimal API server might actually be one. So maybe that's one that we go back to and say, look, here's a. Maybe that's like something, David, this is, uh, this could be a continuation of some of the other threads, would be um, we go back and we look at, okay, what's the simplest possible KC feature? KCP structure that looks like you could start a cube API server, inject a bunch of stuff, and run it as a binary uh, based on the fork branch and imagining like the first iteration. Does not have to be at the same time, but that that would continue mm -hmm. like the three arcs of KCP, which is um, composable cube API server machinery, yeah. a reason to use a control plane, and the ability for a control plane to scale. Yeah. So in terms of Things we would like to deliver in a month timeline to concretely show people uh, a doc about policy, like where we are thinking about policy and workspaces going, seems useful. And a doc about how we plan to make this shardable and scalable, including moving uh, workspaces across shards transparently to controllers that might be watching them, like. We're talking about a doc for these things and not a uh, like demonstrable oh, I'm about, demo. Oh, I'm talking about demonstrable demos. I don't actually think the code Fantastic. is that hard. I don't think the code's that hard. I think it's agreeing on a concept and being able to articulate a set of use cases that other people could agree on. Use cases are the hard bit, the code's the easy bit. Because for instance, you can demonstrate KCP starting up and then instead of today where you can just ad hoc create logical clusters, Imagine going into the root workspace and creating a workspace. Yeah, so. yeah. I assume that there is some uh, pending work behind that, especially the fact that for now, um, CRDs, well, APIs that you have in the admin logical cluster are not by default inherited by other um, uh, logical clusters. I mean, th there are possibly we have to check, but. Uh, Underlying challenges that were not tackled for now, and that may be related to to those. Yeah, things. I actually think David too that that starts tying into what I would call maybe the another phase, which is not part of the first one, which would be what is the scalable design for someone who wants to expose an API to tens mm. of thousands or millions of users yeah, yeah, and sure. needs to vary implementations and life cycles coherently. So like, how do you run canary versions of an API? How do you run canary versions of a controller? That, that I think should be separated. And I would say what we have today is good enough to show TMC. So it's a little bit less on that focus. Um, we, we obviously want to allow you to install CRDs and have them work in your current namespace. But the virtualization infrastructure for APIs needs probably its own demo chunk. We would just, I think we can kick it out of this one because mm -hmm. we're at the, we need, we need examples through Syncer and some of the other things we're talking about um, to demonstrate it. Like, how would I concretely go and write a multi cluster controller? I need to have a mental model that works for multi cluster. Um, what yeah. is the mental model? When, so, when you say, when you say multi cluster controller, is that, a transparent multi-cluster controller where the controller just said, uh, like uh, Tecton, for instance, consumes task runs and produces pods and isn't aware of how those pods are scheduled. That's very easy to make transparent because it can just give back to KCP, hey, schedule this pod somewhere. Uh, or are you talking about more like the demo that, the, that we just saw where some controller is making a scheduling decision uh, You know, gets some that. resource and says, I, I know how which cluster to put these things on. Uh, the the idea of uh, uh, unpacking resources into buckets is a type of controller. Um, I think we'd start with a more general type, which is, can I expose an API that has an effect that's completely orthogonal to the system? It's a little bit like the demo we just saw. How would you write a controller that worked across, you know, a thousand shards and a million, um, a million individual logical clusters or workspaces? How would you evolve that API over time? How would you shard that effectively? So that is a prereq for the, the question of, okay, well, now that I have that, how would I go design, how would I reuse scheduling across different problem domains? 
but not have to keep writing my own schedule or and re-implement taints right. and tolerations or resource management each time. Those, so those are, I think those can be pushed further out down the tree. Mm. And we should actually turn this right. into a tree in the docs of we're explicitly eliminating things from the short run to be able to productively show something that is relevant to immediate users. It's nice to be able to make efficient controllers and reuse existing stuff in the world. That's not the point of what the current phase yeah, is. Yeah, sure. Right. I think even even more complex. So you mentioned the use case of having a transparent multi cluster controller. You would want to be able to canary those versions, uh, and that adds some complexity. There's even more complexity if you want the user to be able to pin to some version, or not even like that. Like the default case is I install or I configure or I request controller. You know, Tecton version zero twenty one. And I, I want to be responsible for upgrading it to 22 and 23, uh, and not that I'm opting into some service that automatically upgrades me over time. Or maybe I do, but well, no, uh, the, the, it, I, some I, people... I almost certainly, I almost certainly think that that is a portion of the story, which is the complete story for APIs is sometimes you care about very strict API evolution, sometimes you don't. The level of yeah. service that someone offers for an API that has very strong contracts is different than when you're YOLOing your team's quick CRD with a quick hack yeah. controller. How do we yeah. isolate and separate those two while giving each one the flexibility to do what it needs? So I, I, let's 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 put that into the third bucket, not part of this time frame, because the prereqs for it come out of thinking about those problems, and that would almost certainly mm -hmm. be just a doc. Yeah. Okay. Um, but that is. Uh, sort of the overlap and 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 uh, crossroads of the policy workspace uh, design and controllers because you want to say I can install a controller or configure or opt into a controller as part of my workspace's policy and that well, workspace policy is I now I want to upgrade the version of that or I want to opt into uh, yeah, you're floating not, versions. You're probably you're probably not dealing with controllers. You're probably dealing with APIs. But yeah, you, you say, yeah, yeah, um, how do yeah. I how do I expose a set of consistent APIs to a user? So imagine a um, uh, the set of resources that uh, the OCM exposes in a consistent chunk. How would someone get a chunk of API resources that allow them to do ACM or OCM like things and have an API for it? How would you allow someone to have a chunk of cube like resources? How would you allow someone to have only uh, Knative functions and service binding objects? Um, and then how would those evolve and how would you shard scale and do that? So it is a, right. it, it is a, it is tied in with organizational policy as you say, Jason. Yeah, I don't, uh, I think I mostly agree with you, but somewhat disagree with you on the fact that it's just APIs. Like, I, I think, there, I think that is uh, an issue of, I am a workspace and I would like to enable the Knative APIs or whatever. I think there is a, a separate further issue of, I want to install or configure or whatever Knative version X APIs with version Y controllers for them because even though the sure, API, a, like, APIs uh, APIs and implementations are actually the same thing, like you, a, you, you do want to have being able for us to write that down involves sorting the use cases. Like that's a one percent use case or a five percent use case. The hundred percent use case or the ninety nine percent use cases. Yeah, I expect to be able to create a pod, a function, a deployment, a service a RBAC rule, a, a bucket, a quota, um, maybe a couple of the other resources. And then mm -hmm. the spectrum between, I want to set up a canary test and choose an implementation. And then the, how do you delegate control over implementation to a third party? That's where the mm -hmm. organizational policy comes in. So yeah, absolutely. Gotcha. It, it's a spectrum from one end to the other. We need to kind of have a, we need to be able to articulate the spectrum. And I think we're getting close to that with some of the, um, some of the stuff we've been doing around the sinker and around the so yeah. I hope to have some of that stuff out um, very shortly, but that wouldn't be a that wouldn't be a key blocker. We can start discussing it and asking questions about what use cases does it not solve and does it map right. to the problems people have at large scale in API system. Yeah. Uh, as a bookmark for a future topic, because I don't want to get into it with seven minutes left, I think we should uh, Settle on whether we think users will. You keep you keep mentioning Canary as the as the use case, which assumes people generally are on an up to date up to date thing and sometimes want to Canary before they do an update. That's part that's part of it. That's important to get right. I think in reality most users pin to a version six versions ago, 
and every year or two upgrade to the newest version or a newer version and then yeah. sit on that for two years. And both and of those, the, it, it cause different downstream problems for us because it means whether we need to support roughly one or two versions of things or like 50 versions of things. Yeah, and the current, um, the current, the current cube system cannot properly handle evolution of APIs because there's no outside the box way of handling the evolution of those APIs. Right. Uh, the difference is, is that uh, a little bit like libraries, a good library doesn't break its API and offers concrete changing. If you're building APIs that are intended to be transient, those would not be the class of things that would be exposed to tens of thousands of users because there's a fund fundamental mismatch between design of an API that you plan to change all the time and the actual point of an API. You might have, right. you, you need to be able to evolve people from one API to another, and that's a separable problem. Right, I think again, we're talking about APIs as if the implementation is not part of the effective API, right? Uh, the API between Knative version 20 and 21 remains exactly the same, but the implementation of it is slightly different in some way that matters to me. Whether or not it actually matters to me or I'm just afraid of it mattering to me, so I'm not going to update. Uh, I think in reality, people, I don't want to limit the conversation to APIs because the controller like logic, the implementation of it is is well, so, also important. Yeah, we, we should be cautious that when we say implementation, we're saying uh, an API exposes those by virtue of existing. If you change, you have changed the API, but if you didn't communicate that, that leads to the fear you're discussing, and that's where the failures happen. So what we're what we're effectively talking about is can you detect the difference in an API, and when an API has a different definition, regardless of whether it's implementation or API side, can you make the transition between those? That That's part of evolution. Like, how do you find the people who are willing to opt in to be broken? Um, so right. we're, we're, we definitely got in the weeds on this. Um, David, yeah. do you want to jump over? So sharding is ongoing. Uh, I shared a doc with you today on uh, uh, the consistent list watch and a set of problems that would have to be solved. Um, this is mostly just to give a framework for what we would do with sharding in terms of um, to be able to effectively do a shard, you also need to be able to understand how to implement watch across a set of shards. And so just trying to make sure that we can articulate all of the challenges in one spot. We'll then go back in and say, okay, well, is this worth the cost? Um, what would a prototype look like? What, how do we stage up the set of prototypes um, to shard underneath you know, uh, more than one KCP instance uh, or across more than one KCP instance for a set of workspaces? So, all right, uh, yeah. and that's basically it. Steven, uh, Steven I are, iterating on that actively now. Great. David, did you want to use the last four minutes to talk about Dev Workspaces uh, prototype? Yes, I started last week um, looking into trying to run the Dev Workspace. So, you know, the engine, the new engine behind the Quality Workspaces IDs, uh, Cloud ID. Uh, so Dev Workspace, mainly it's a, a one, two, or sometimes three custom resources that are um, that have a controller that finally create a deployment with a number of things like PVs, uh, PVCs, uh, services, and other and config maps and secrets and other stuffs uh, to to have a, a full blown uh, IDE. And so, um, yeah, I tried. I started trying to to run that on on KCP. The whole point is precisely to show that we can have uh, application based. CRDs on on the KCP layer only, and and have the running deployments that uh, underpin the the works the, the IDs uh, on on physical clusters, and especially being able uh, if you create a workspace in one namespace to have the all the objects of the you know uh, um, dev workspace being put on one given physical cluster and maybe uh, the IDE for another workspace, um, dev workspace in another namespace put in a distinct uh, uh, cluster. So obviously I had to unplug webhooks from, from the dev workspace controller because they are not supported at all for now. And, and yeah, things are, are moving forward. Um, if possible, I'd like to, I might present a short demo of this if it sort of works tomorrow uh, in the DevTools uh, uh, org uh, in, the, in, in, in a presentation about App Studio. Uh, but Great. If you, 
David, if you uh, if that demo works, I love the the attitude of mostly working. Maybe if it works, uh, if that yeah, works yeah. for your internal demo tomorrow, if you could share that next week, that'd be even that'd be cool. Exactly, yes. and, and yeah. I probably post uh, things. Uh, cool. Interesting things is yes that um, finally we find a, a, a number of you know bugs or things to fix also in the existing prototype. So that's quite uh, interesting. Also to um, bring up the various limitations that we were not aware and that um, you know that are shown by real cases like real use cases like this one which is quite a complete uh, use case to be fair cool uh, I look forward to seeing it and thank you for working on that um, all right with that uh, I'm gonna call time and post the recording shortly after this. Uh, I added some notes. If you have other notes you think I missed, uh, feel free to add them to the issue uh, or mention it in Slack or any of the other ways. All right. Thanks, everyone. Stop. Thanks. Bye. See you, everyone.